the Arduino series for CSC 270. Um, so, for those of you who are away from campus, I will start with this slideshow of photos I took um, last week, right after um, our snowstorm, about uh, almost a week ago. Um, so you'll see um, um, Smith under a, a nice blanket of, uh, of snow. I don't know what just happened here. Um, so, um, yeah, it was nice. It was um, very different. What was especially different is that I saw only one student during the whole time. I went all around campus and saw only one person outside taking photos as well with her phone. Um, so a little eerie but beautiful. So anyway, I'll start by sharing that. I'll put a link to my um, album. It's a Google photo album. I'll put a link uh, later on um, in case you want to use some of these for other purposes. Anyway. Uh, all right, so let's get started. Um, by the way, I have my cup of coffee, so um, I'm ready for this. This is a long unit, so we may, we may want to take a break at some point. Um, so first I'm going to look at the performance of the, um, the Mega. You, as a computer scientist, it's always a good idea to see how good the tool that you're using is. And I like to do that every time I get a new uh, computer to play with, and Arduino is a computer. So we'll look at the performance. And my favorite application is the N-Queens uh, algorithm. And so we'll take a look at how the Arduino and the old Arduino fare in that game. And then we're going to look at the digital I.O. pin. So today, in this unit, um, what I really want to do is, is look at the digital um, I.O. pins. So um, that's the N-Queens problem. Uh, let me go quickly to that page. Um, here is, is a great, um, it's a GIF, animated GIF, that shows the algorithm. And what you want is to put, again, so I'm assuming that all of you know, but to remind you, you have an 8x8 eight eight board, and you want to put n queens such that the queens do not take each other. And queens can move horizontally, vertically, and diagonally. And so what the algorithm does, it puts a queen, for example, the very first one is going to put it here because there's nothing else on the board. Then it's going to try all the positions on this row until it finds one that uh, is not taken by the previous queen. queen. And, and you see here that it didn't go anywhere, so it's trying something else. And then little by little, it, um, so it, it, it progresses and then comes back. This is called backtracking. And it's, uh, what is interesting is that it's heavily computer intensive, CPU in intensive. So it doesn't really use much of the memory it really tests the processing power of the process of the, the yeah the processing power of the microprocessor here. It doesn't use the network, it doesn't use the disk, it doesn't use you know really much memory because everything is going to be in the cache if there's a cache. So it's good um, you know kind of first uh, first degree um, performance um, comparison of the various uh, processors. So all right, so that's that. And uh, so I've written a program for the Arduino. It's so I've taken a C program, which is the NQueens uh, program that can run on any uh, typical laptop, including a Mac or a Windows PC. And I've adapted it. So if you're wondering how we adapt a um, program, a C program, uh, to the Arduino, knowing that the Arduino in the sketch, there's only two main functions, setup and loop. And loop is run repeatedly. We saw that in unit one. So and you don't want a main program. So main is already part of the sketch. It's, it's invisible, but it's, it's there to make everything work. So how do we do that? So here is how um, I, I do it, is that here is an example of a Hello World program in C, includes standard I.O., int main, int argsy, char argv, printf, hello world, return zero. All right, so what I'm going to do, um, I'm going to copy it here. But I'm going to rename it instead of main, I'm going to call it main2. And I'm keeping the same arguments here, I don't need to change that. And then instead of a printf, I'm going to use serial print, because that's the way the Arduino is going to send information. It has to send it over the USB to our laptop, so that the laptop can show the output in the monitor window, serial monitor window. So I'm going to replace the printf, so you see here I've commented it out. And I'm going to use serial print and print only that string. And remember, a serial print prints only one thing. You can only print one, either a string, or an int, or a float, 
You, this, sometimes you can use a second argument, and that's the base. So if you want to print in hexadecimal or in binary or whatever, then you can have the second argument. But usually you can share your print only one thing at a time. And here it's great because it's Hello World. And then in my setup program, all I have to do is I have to set that the USB connection to the laptop is going to be at 9600 baud. And then I'm calling main2. And main2 needs two arguments. The first one is an integer, the second one is a pointer. So I'm passing zero and null because I know main2, my main program doesn't use them. So this is an easy way of not having to change too much of my code. And then loop, look at this. Loop doesn't do anything. It's going to be called forever, repeatedly, and it'll do nothing. But that's fine. Let's open the link. So that's the end queen's um, program for the Arduino. So it's slightly different. Um, I don't need to include, so it's interesting for you guys as programmers, seeing how I'm adapting a C program to run on the Arduino. It's going to need a tiny bit of uh, changes. So I need to comment out these standard libraries because they're already part of the sketch. The sketch, remember, tries to make it simpler for neophytes, you know, um, enthusiasts to program the Arduino without knowing too much about programming which is a great way to get into programming. So we have to comment this out, if it's not needed. However, I'm going to measure the amount of time it takes for the program to uh, solve a, um, the problem. So I need time h, which is not included by default. Um, I, I have my prototypes. So the idea here is that I list what the function name and what parameters it expects. I don't need to give the name of the parameters. I just have to say, well, the first thing is in it. Next thing is an array, two-dimensional array of ints, and then the third thing is an int, and that's going to define, so for those of you who know assembly language, it's going to define what the stack frame is for the program, what, um, how, how much stack space is reserved and by what, when the function is going to be called. So once the compiler sees this, it doesn't, have, doesn't need to know what the name here, I'm, I'm, see I, for this int, this variable, I'm saying just int, I don't have to, to specify the name of the variable. Although here I do it, but it doesn't really matter. What the compiler is interested in knowing is it what will the stack look like? What do I have to push in the stack? And so when it knows that, then it will know how to resolve any call to function that it's going to find. And here is my main two. Okay, so that's the main of the original Enqueen's program. And that's the function, the recursive function that does all the work. And then after that I, I print it. Um, and the, the rest is, is there. So I'm I'm gonna go set up. So what setup does, it, it sets the, uh, the communication. Um, it uh, tells us that it has started, tells us what value of n it's working with, and then that's where it measures the elapsed, the amount of time that main2 is going to take in milliseconds. And millis is a function that is supported by the Arduino. Um, so and then it's going to print the, uh, the, the, the time at the end. So that's um, what it's going to look like. That's the program that is going to be running. All right, so benchmark. Um, so just to give you an idea, this is what various laptops and computers that I've worked with throughout the, the, the years, um, what the execution time is. And, and so if you look between 14 here and 24, so these are the, the, the size of the board. In, in computer science, you don't limit yourself to an 8x8 board. You could imagine what a 9x9 chessboard could look like and what it could be like to put 9 queens on that. So that's what these values are. And so all of these times here are in milliseconds. So you see that everything here pretty much is under a second. 610 milliseconds, that's half a second pretty much. Um, and uh, so I'm not sure why I stopped right here. I should include everything um, there. Sorry. All right. So um, when we run that um, on the Arduino, then um, we get a, a very different um, result. So let me connect my Arduino and, um, and see what what we get. All right, so I've reset the Arduino, and we notice that, so um, these are the values of n, n equals 4, 5, 6, and so on, and that's the amount of time that we spent. So that is the same Arduino that you're using in your kit. Um, and we see here, this is the first one that is interesting for 18 
n equals 18, I'm spending 3 seconds, 3 and a half seconds. And here, 18 seconds for 20. So let's go back to um, here. So 18 and 20. So 20, this is what we had spent. So that um, 20 right here, 18 seconds. So 18 seconds for our Arduino compared to less than 200 milliseconds, less than two tenths of a second for all these laptops, and some of them pretty old laptops. 2009 is a pretty old laptop. Um, so that's not very impressive, and that's fine. Um, that's not what the Arduino is for. It's not for the real computation. It's because it has all these ports attached to, to it and all these different devices we can connect. That's what makes it interesting. And, and to um, monitor uh, various things and, and activate motors and LEDs that are going to be watched and seen and, and experienced by human beings, being slow, that slow is not a problem. We don't need a super, super speed. And you see here that I'm still stuck at n equals 22. It's still trying to, um, to solve that. All right. Um, I want to show you, so what I've also done is that uh, when, I, when I first started playing and introducing the Arduino in class, um, this was the, the one, let's see, the so DSC Miller, and um, it's even slower than the one. So the one I can show you, I'll, I'll show you more about that later, but that's my setup for the, um, the one we, we're using in class. So that's the original one, so how much slower was this one? So I'm going to show you, this is interesting. So this, this is really to show you that um, if you're comparing um, the Arduino to a, a, a desktop, a nice gaming desktop um, station, no comparison. This is, you know, this is a baby, baby here compared to um, this athlete right there. Um, informal results, so we've just seen that, and that's the original Arduino right here. And that's the one that we just um, played with. Um, so take, let's take a look at this. N equals 4, so I put them on the same line. So for N equals 13, our current Arduino spent one-tenth of a second solving a 14. This guy spent 23 million milliseconds, which is 23,000 seconds. So 23,000 seconds, that's, you know, about five, six hours. Um, and, you know, I didn't wait for it. I just started it and got, got, got the, the result later on. But um, so th this one is about an hour. So n equals 13. So that's 3 million, 300 milliseconds. So that means 3,387 seconds. We know an hour is 3,600 seconds. That's an hour. And so this is almost an hour compared to seven milliseconds. So gives us so this this guy, which we can, you can still play with, and they, they they cost almost nothing really now. So let's continue. So more references on the Arduino. If you need more information about the Arduino, um, you can use uh, these. These are good references. Linda is not free unless you're a Smith College student, and you go on the VPN. You should be able to access that. Um, the controller, so what this is, it's um, what I'm showing here. It's a schematic of what's inside. So let's see if I can see the reflection of this, it's, see this, little, this chip here. So that's what the diagram here is. Um, so the, the whole chip is, the black chip I showed you is this. And the CPU, microprocessor, is right there. And you see that it's much more than a processor. It's processor plus EEPROM, which is where um, you have um, the bootloader, uh, things that stay forever even when the, the, the computer is turned off. Uh, there's some more memory somewhere. Oh, yeah, XRAM, flash RAM, static RAM, uh, and a lot of other things. And so we're going to see the word port. And think of port as... A, so kind of a port is a flip-flop where the, 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 the microcontroller, the processor there can store a bit, one or zero, and then it's available on an output line. Or um, it's a um, kind of a gate 
that will be able to re to receive whatever signal digital signal is out there from a switch from a sensor and it makes it available and so um, the processor has, has pins that are called bidirectional so information can go one way or the other but you have to tell you have when you program the microcontroller you you, you program it so that a particular pin is going to work as an output or as an input you're going to see that very soon um, so um, couldn't resist this this um, slide uh, those of you who are following uh, this uh, in a CSE 270 course at Smith College. I've taken CSE 231, which is assembly language, where we learn assembly language and other things about architecture and operating system. And we do um, assembly, we program in assembly for the Pentium. So this is assembly for the chip that is on the Arduino. So let's see if we recognize anything. Well, yes, we say, oh, look, there's an instruction and there's an operand and another operand. Oh, it looks like it's a comment. Uh, oh, that's a label. Oh, another instruction. So, guess what? We don't recognize the instruction too much, except for this one, maybe, right? Okay. Oh, yeah, that's return. So, okay, we return that. So, that's very likely a function, a procedure, something that we're gonna, that is going to be called, and we're going to return from it. Uh, but what we do recognize, uh, or I recognize, is these things, R18, R17, R16. These are registers. So the um, the processor um, on uh, our um, Arduino actually doesn't have EAX, CBX, CCX, CDX, CSI, EDI, ESP, BP that we saw for the 32-bit Pentium, uh, but it has 32 registers labeled R0 to R31. Um, so it's different. So what we see is that processors have different kind of um, uh, ways of being built and and you know there's no standard way of doing that and and designers at Intel have decided that you know EAX, CBX, CCX, CDX was sufficient for data registers. The um, designers that design the um, the Arduino chip decided that um, 32 was a better number. Um, and so you know we, we have different choices. So that's if you're interested in learning more about that, this is called computer organization or computer architecture. Um, so there are classes online um, on that. Uh, anyway, books. Um, it, it is interesting. It's all a question of trade-offs. How do we design something to be efficient? Uh, processor information. So that's what I was just mentioning. So that explains a little bit of what's go on, going on with that. It's a system on a chip, SOC. System on a chip means it's a processor, memory, and ports all in one piece of silicon. And so there's 32 registers. There's EEPROM, there's static RAM, um, and plenty of other things. Timers. Um, this is a standard keyword for serial communication, such as USB. Um, analog to digital converter, so sort of signal that is not digital, that is not zero volt or five volt, that could be anything in between. We're going to be able to measure and see if it, you know, what what particular voltage it is. Um, anyway, plenty of, of other things that are available there. I'm going to, oh, something that we're going to see, SPI. It's a particular protocol for serial communication. So this Arduino could be integrated, for example, in a car. Car, um, cars manufactured all, um, all over the world have uh, used something like SPI for the different computers on board to talk to each other. All right, digital I.O. Um, so there are three um, functions that we need to learn in order to do uh, digital input-output. Pin mode will allow us to define whether a particular pin is going to be used as an output or an input. And so there are three different ways of specifying input or output. We can use the keyword input or the keyword output. And there's an extra one called input pull up. So we'll look at that in this unit. Um, digital read is uh, if we want to read the level that is available in a pin. Maybe that pin is connected to a switch, which we will do today. Um, so digital read will read that value. And the value will be either low or high. So these are two constants. It's not 0, 0.5, it's not 0, 0.1, it's low and high. 
And digital right, and we do that, we're going to do that first, is when you output a level on a pin, and if you connect that pin to an LED, you're going to turn, turn the LED on or the LED off. So that digital right, and when you want to write something, you specify the pin number. And so the pin number could be 13. That's the pin that is connected to the LED on board. There's only one little LED on board that is connected to a pin. That's pin 13. It's a built-in LED as a constant. And the value, do we want to store? And again, it's going to be high and low. Right? These are the constants. So this is the blink here, sketch that I've replicated. So we see that in setup, I'm setting pin 13 as output. And here I'm using the number, not the constant, same thing. So I'm saying pin 13 is going to be used as an output. And that's done only once at the beginning of the sketch. And then in the loop, that is going to go over, over. I'm going to set pin 13 to be high. Wait one second, so that's 1,000 millisecond, one second. Then I'm going to set pin 13 low. Wait one second, and then the and then the loop function ends and it's called again right away. So high low. So it's uh, we're going to have this here. Look at that. My pen switched automatically to a fountain pen instead of a marker. So what, and which is exactly what I want. So I'm going to have a signal. That's going to look like that on pin 13. And that will be one second, and that will be one second. Therefore, the period T will be two seconds. And you know what the frequency of this is. All right. Important rule. Um, once you use a pin for input or output in, in a, in, in, in a, for, with a sketch, so you build something, so you're going, to decide, you're going to decide that you're going to use some pins for output, some pins for input. Um, and uh, you know, we have other, also other options, pulse with modulation, uh, analog, and so on. But that, more on that later. Um, so once you do that, that's it. You do not change for the rest of the sketch. So once you build something, you, don't, you want the software to not change whether a pin is going to be used as input or output. It'd be tempting to do that in sophisticated project, but we don't. Um, all right, so um, this is more information about the digital I.O. Um, we have 54, oh, now I want a marker, please. We have 54 digital pins on the uh, 2560 mega, and they can be used as input-output um, using pin mode, digital read, digital write. Uh, they operate, this is important, 5 volt. Each pin can provide or receive a maximum of 40 million. Okay, so I'm going to um, go deeper with, with that and, and bring back things that we've seen before, which is the Ohm's law. Um, and it also is telling us that pin 0 and pin 1 are also used for the USB. So that's what serial 0 is. It's the, the, the way the, um, the Arduino controller talks to our laptop through the USB. It has to use two pins, so the S in USB again is, means serial. So it's going to send all the information serially on one wire out to the laptop. And it's going to receive information from the laptop on one wire. And that's pin 0 and pin 1. So we could be tempted to use them for a, a, a project, for building something. And we won't, because if we do, then we won't be able to communicate with the Arduino. And there's also three other serial ports that are available. So some pins are actually are, are multifunctions. They, they can be used as digital input output, but they can also be used, um, there's, there's enough hardware and firmware to make these pins work as serial, um, serial ports, so communication with another serial uh, device. So that's pin 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14. So, you know, with 54 pins, we have plenty for what we need that we shouldn't have to use 0, 1, 18, 19, 16, 17, and 14, 15. All right. Um, and so what this slide is telling us is that um, we can also use this, um, this. So some of these digital IO pins can be used for other things. So not only serial, but we're going to look at pulse width modulation at some point. Um, there's pin 13 is connected to the LED, we just saw that, we talked about that. And then there's um, a TWI control um, communication pin, so this, that's a protocol, and we have some pins 20 and 21 that are going to support that. More on that later, but it's good to know that 
there's more to the Arduino than just input and output. Some of these pins can be used in sophisticated communication protocols. All right, so here is the first way of connecting an LED to, uh, to the Arduino. And you'll do that in the lab. So um, don't worry about that. I will try to demonstrate that at, in, at the end, maybe in a separate unit. But um, so that's the way we could do that. And so what all we need to do is we need a resistor. Oops, let's go back. We need a resistor connected to plus five. Um, so right now I don't know what value I need to um, apply to the resistor. And then an LED, so that's my LED, uh, which passes current from one place. And then we're gonna connect that to one pin. And here, um, I don't know, it looks like I'm connected to pin, so let's see, uh, 33, 40, 51, that may be 53 right here. And you see that this block is a nice block, I will be using that a lot in, uh, in first time. Um, so now the, the question is what value of R, and I cannot write here for some reason, what value of R should I use? Well, Ohm's law. Ohm's law says, um, Ohm's law says the voltage across whatever you measure is going to be equal to the current going through that times the resistance that whatever device it is is providing to the current. So the higher the resistance, given a fixed voltage, then the lower the, the current. So what did we learn in the slide previously? The slide previously said that if there's a current that is going to go from plus 5 to the pin and inside the pin to ground, so that's that's how we're going to output a low level. We're going to provide a path on the output pin to ground so that the current can go through, and if it goes through, we force a low level by connecting connecting the, the electrical wire to ground, we say, okay, we're providing a zero. So we know that whatever comes in here at most should be 40 milliamps. That's what the previous slide said, at most 40 milliamps. So um, if the, so let's, let's figure out what five equals I equals 40 milliamp times R. And that's R is R, um, so that's five volt. R is R unknown. So that means that R is equal to five over 40 times 10 to the minus three. So that is five over 40, 10 to the third power, which is roughly equivalent to five over 50, 10 to the third, which is 0 0.1, 10 to the third, which is 10 to the second ohm. So at least we need 100 ohm. So that's what, um, and that's what I would like you to feel comfortable doing because otherwise a lot of people don't know Ohm's law and they're going to try different things. So they're going to use rule of thumbs, which is fine, but we know better. And here we know that in order for us, for that, for that Arduino not to be stressed, we're going to need a resistor greater than 100 ohm. So you know what? One kilo ohm is going to be perfect. And if I don't find a 1 kilo ohm, mm -hmm. 10 kilo ohm, the LED will still uh, light, I'll still see it. And if you look in your Arduino kit, you're going to find that you do have um, resistors and they come um, kind of with little um, tape on the side to, to organize them. And you should be able to find, let's see, I have several of them here. Maybe I'm not, oh yeah, so it may not be easy to see this, but I have a bunch of 1K resistors here, and so I'm going to use that for my experiment. So um, remember how to go through that. So basically what I did here in order to find what value resistor um, I need, I will, I will look at what is the maximum current that can go through? Well, the maximum current is gonna, that is going to be involved here is when the voltage here is zero volt. Okay, 
So if the voltage here is zero volt, then there's a total difference of five volts between, oops, where am I here? Between here and here is five volts. So now I can apply Ohm's law to my resistor. I find what an equivalent resistor would be for 40 milliamps. And I know that if I increase the resistance, then the, the current is going to be lower because the 5 is constant. And the Ohm's law itself says V equals resistor times current. So the higher, the more I'm going to, the bigger I'm going to make the resistor, the smaller the current. And I want the current to not be greater than 40 milliamps, so I'm going to try to make it smaller. So anything about one, above 100 ohm is going to be good for me. But 100 would be the limit. So, you know, 1K. Perfect. You're going to be safe. All right. So let me um, erase all this. So what is it that I want to show you here? Well, let's assume that my um, output is low here. So I have a sketch that outputs low on the pin. Well, if I have low on the pin, so low means zero volt, so there's going to be a current going through here. My LED is going to turn on. So is that what I want? Well, if I know about it, that's great, that's fine, because I say, okay, I'm going to output zero, and the LED is going to turn on. Well, that's kind of counterintuitive. You would want that if you output zero, the LEDs turn off. And if you output high, the LED should be on. So this particular de design that I have gives me the opposite. You can always fix that in software, always output the opposite of what your signal is, and then you'll be, you'll be fine. But we just need to, to realize that, that this kind of turns on the LED when the signal is low, turns off the LED when the signal is high. It's not the best. So another way of solving this is to wire things slightly differently, where I connect my pin, my output pin, to a resistor. I always need a resistor to the, the LED to ground. So this is ground. So now, when I have a high level here, and high, think, 5 volt, so suddenly I have a 5 volt um, difference in potential across my resistor and my diode. I assume that the diode has no resistance. It's a good approximation. Not quite right, but good. Um, so in this case, if uh, the pin outputs a high level, then there's a current and my LED turns on. Great. What about if I have um, an output of zero volt? So let me use a different color here. So let's assume that my output is low or zero volt. So will current go from zero volt and ground, by the way, is zero volt. So no current, current, think of the current as being lazy. If you say, all right, I have a wire uh, connected from zero volt and zero volt there, and I have a resistor in between, well, electrons go from zero volt to zero volt. It's like water. Would I, you know, I have water in one recipient at the same level, water in another recipient, and the tube in between, water is not going to go there. You know, even if you kind of force it, there's not going to be any flow. So in that case, there's, you can think of it as being a current of zero. So there's no current. Okay, so I can, so, all right, there's no current. So the LED is off. So you output low, LED is off. You output high in green, the LED is on. So that's a good way of wiring um, an LED to your output. Um, try to do that on your own. If I have, you know, I could decide to turn on three different LEDs with the same output pin. So what should I need for my resistors? Um, so we said that we saw that you know 200 um, something like. Uh, 200 ohms would be sufficient, so in this case, um, what should my resistor be so that at most I'm going to have 40 million going in? So think about that. Um, could be a good quiz question. So that's the setup. So I wanted to show you that um, just as a way of setting your, um, your, your Raspberry, your Arduino, um, I have. Um, so you should all have this board, a breadboard, it's a long breadboard, and what I've done is that I've put the uh, Arduino on top of it, and I've fastened it with uh, rubber bands. 
I like to put the rubber band here because by doing that, you know, it'd be tempting to let me use a different color here. So I put my rubber band here because hey, because I want to show my sleeve. Because you know, it'd be tempting to put the rubber band between this point. But if you do that, you're gonna you're gonna hide the pin numbers here. So um, so that works well. The USB is at the end here, USB. So you can do your wiring right here with LEDs and switches and registers and so on. Um, all right, so it's a nice, I think it's a nice setup. We've, we've done that before, it works well. Um, and here is my um, my first setup, um, which I have implemented here. And um, what I have is we're gonna, we're gonna, um, we, we just seen that. Um, from a pin, I'm going to the LED, so right here to the LED, actually, uh, let's see if a different color may work a little better. So, uh, it's hard to see, but anyway. So from the pin to the LED, LED to a different column, to the register, and to the um, ground. So blue here, see at the top, that blue line is connected to ground. So this blue wire that is right here, I hope you're seeing this on your screen, is ground. And the red here next to it is connected to plus 5. So I have, so that plus that is right here is plus 5. The minus that is right here is ground. So I'm going to keep that wired this way forever. And this way I will have plus 5 and ground available on my uh, breadboard uh, for any kind of design I may want to, uh, to do. So that's another view of it. Um, and, and you can see how I'm, I'm doing this. All right. Uh, so digital input. So digital input. And by the way, remember, you're going to do all this in the, um, in the lab. So you're welcome to try it right now. But I would say just wait for the lab, the, the lab and you'll, you'll put an LED on the board together by yourself. Um, so here, what I want to show is that when we do digital input, we're going to get the input from something that generates a zero or five volt. And here is one example, and a flip flop. A D flip flop could be something that we may want to read, and that D flip flop may catch a bit from somewhere. Um, it could be an inverter that we have here that somehow connects that, or it could be an AND gate that connects that, or it could be a switch, and that's what we're going to be doing uh, next. So um, there's plenty of different devices that can generate a high or low, and um, we've played with some of them for the first half of the semester, so that's what we're going to be doing. So here is um, one way, and by the way, this is coffee time. So the temperature of the coffee is giving me an idea of how long this has been, and it's been already pretty long. So I have to show you two uh, different things about input, and we're going to be done with, with that unit. So bear, uh, bear with me here a little bit. So how do I use the switch? So that's my switch, and it can be open or closed. And how can I use that to um, generate a low or high level on an input for uh, the Arduino? So it could be that you know we're turning a switch on and off, and you've done that with uh, finite state machines, you can control how things go. So this is how we'd wire it up. So that's a register R. We know the value of the register. If you use 1K now, it's going to be standard. Uh, or anything higher than 1K should be fine. If you find 2.7K or 4.7K, sorry, 2.2K. So registers don't come in kind of um, discrete values. Um, should, should be fine. 2.2, uh, 4, 10, 10K would work as well. So um, how do I do that? Well, I connect one side of the switch to ground, and this gray wire that I've shown here, this gray wire, just to remind you that the ground that I'm showing here is the ground of the Arduino. So ground, plus, ground and plus five um, here. I'm showing them, but um, it makes sense. So it should, you know, very soon I will 
just not even show you that the ground and BCC are connected to the Arduino. These are the two wires that um, I've shown you on my on my board. It's always connected. So when the switch, um, so let's uh, figure out how this works. When the switch is open, what happens? Well, this pin here in Arduino is connected through a resistor 2 plus 5. So if the switch is open, the pin is going to see a high level because it's connected directly through a resistor, but it's connected directly to plus 5. It's high. So open means high level read by the Arduino. All right. So let's erase all this. Change the, let's erase. Oops, let's erase this as well. Let's change the color. Now, if I close the switch, so see it is closed. Or maybe I'm going to really show a big block here. So closed. If the switch is closed, then we see that that pin is connected to ground. There's a direct path from that pin to ground. You can say, oh, it's connected to plus 5. So, oh, yeah, but that resistor here is allowing a difference in potential. So there's 5 volts across the resistor. So I really have 0 volt here. So the resistor is really helping me here in letting that pin go to a low level. And the resistor is kind of a buffer between the plus 5 and ground. And, and so my pin is going to register a low. So closed. means low. All right, and that's how I built a switch for um, to generate a digital low high. So digital input. All right, so now this is how we would write a sketch for um, using a, um, a switch. So here in, in this particular sketch, let's take a look at, uh, let me switch back to green. Let's take a look at what I have. That pin 13, that's a built-in uh, pin that is, that's the LED that is on board. And it's also called built-in LED, but I can also use the number 13. I have an input pin of 7, so that's a pin I'm going to use on the side of the Arduino to connect um, the switch to. And the value is, I need an integer, I'm going to keep track of what value I'm reading. I'm making val a global here, so see all of these are global variables. So the LED pin and the in, in pin, in for input, have to be global. Um, but val doesn't have to, but since I have the global section here, I could put it there. I could have declared val right here in this function because that's the only place that it's used. I could have done that. So, um, all right, so computer scientists will understand differences here. So setup, what do I have to do? I have to set up, um, I'm using two pins, one for the LED, one for the, uh, the switch. So LED pin is going to be an output, IN pin is going to be an input. That makes sense. And then in the loop, what I'm going to do is I'm going to digital read, so that's the function that's going to read from the input pin. So it's going to return to me low or high, one or the other, and I'm going to store that in val, and then I'm going to put val and set it on the LED pin. So, um, so that's that. Okay, so um, we can do better to the Arduino, you know, and realizing that um, we, the, every pin on the Arduino, every digital I.O. pin has what is called a pull-up resistor. So there's a little resistor that the same one that we put with our switch. Actually, there's one that is available, if we want, attached to each pin. So we don't have to bring our own resistor attached to the switch. We could use the one that is on board. So that's a nice feature, and the reason that it's there, it's exactly because they know that to do inputs, and we have switches, we would need a resistor, so they already put it on the controller. And so we, But we have to say whether we want to use it or not. Because in some cases, we may not want to. If, we, if the output comes directly from the flip-flop or from an, an AND gate, then we don't need a pull-up register. So, so that's what I'm showing here, is that the register right here is on board, and it's connected on one side here to BCC. 
of the Arduino and it's connected directly to the input pin, whichever one we, we have to use. So what is it that we have to um, implement ourselves? It's very simple. It's like one wire. We need one wire, one switch, and connect to ground. That's it. So we need two wires in order to connect the switch to uh, the Arduino. Um, and so now uh, our hardware is simpler but we have to change um, the sketch slightly. And this change is just illustrated here. The only thing I have to do is this part. We have to say that, and here I'm using pin two, different pin. Uh, pin two is an input pull-up. So that's a constant that is pretty fine. And it says, use the pull-up register that is on the board because I don't have one. And because of that, then I just need two wires, one switch, and that's it. I can activate a high or low voltage for the audio. That's it. That's the end of the unit. Uh, so I, what I would recommend is that you review the previous slides. You redo the calculation for the value of R so that you feel comfortable how we derive that. And um, yeah, uh, if you have many LEDs, what do you do with the resistors? Do you increase them? Like if we have three LEDs, should we make the value of the resistor three times more or three times less? Think about that. Um, all right, and that's the end of the unit. Uh, don't worry, we're going to build things. You're welcome to try now if you want, but the, the lab will have you do that. Okay? All right, have fun.